Hey, it's Chris. Let's do this weekly crowdfunding roundup. Everything you need to know about everything. But really, the first portion of this is going to be me ranting and talking about Elden Ring because um, that's the biggest thing of the week. But don't be fooled. A couple of these other games look like really solid under the radar sleeper hits that are going to get overshadowed. So we're going to talk about those just as much. Well, probably not just as much, but we're going to talk about those extensively as well. As always, if you like what I do, let me know down below. Let me know what you feel about this week, last week, everything else in between, what you're backing, what you're not backing, whatever else you want in the comment section down below, right? Get your popcorn ready. Let's do this. Yep, 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 yep. Here we go. Elden Ring from the top from the get-go. $1.6 million in less than 24 hours raised. So uh, it's only doing a 10-day campaign. So that's why we're going to talk about it really early. <sighs> what do you need to know? Read the rule book. Watch the stuff. Look at stuff. Um... Check out my video from earlier in the week talking about uh, things that are going to either weigh you on one side or the other. Okay, let's go. So $429, $432 now with the exchange rate is going to get you all in of these core box plus the four expansions. Now, if you want to get the most reasonable pledge level for $179, you can, which is going to include one big box expansion, which is really going to actually probably have more like two because they say there's going to be $100 worth of stretch goal unlock, unreveal content, whatever you want to call it nowadays. And they're doing sort of what Simon did a while back, a little bit of Waken Realms as well in terms of the paths, like having people vote one way or the other, which I always have mixed feelings about because there's always this illusion of control and I just wonder how much control you're actually having. Like, do they really have twice as much stuff ready for you to go? Or is it like we've got 10 different choices that you're going to make, but there's really 15 different contents that are going to be available. So, you know, like one of those where like, if you don't guess this, this one uh, now on the first day, it'll pop back up as an option later on day like six or something. You know what I'm saying. But this is Elden Ring, the board game of the video game. But are you okay? As my point number one on the video the other week, earlier in the week was that are you okay with 20% of 25% of the board game being representative of the whole of the video game right now because that's really what you're getting you're not getting the whole video game with this you're getting a partiality and the rule book here again kudos day one love it some thoughts behind the mechanisms with the designer diaries before the campaign again kudos for the transparency of that and the pledge levels but um this rule book is also kind of incomplete they talk about the fact that they're going to be four modes you're going to be managing seven decks of cards you're going to be flipping over tiles you're going to be taking three actions on the overworld phase you're going to be taking three actions on the combat phase as you go back and forth but you're going to be like setting up your combat while other people are taking their turns and so i'm not really sure how well that's going to work because what if the next person literally right after you before you go finish your combat already has to set up their combat are you going to have individual combat boards i didn't necessarily see answers to some of that stuff there's going to be drop in drop out questions they're going to be along with that can you change characters you can't really restat characters because they're giving you preset characters that are going to start with certain things so you can't have some of those uh you know slight variables or more variables depending on how you feel about that that Ellen ring the video game is going to give you so that's the big question um are those things are any of those things make it or break it for you because this is you know an ip based board game and the other question that runs through my mind when i see this and i know you know everyone's expecting this is going to be god zooks raising amount of cash we just saw it with the announcement of like the second avatar movie right that's one of the most expensive movies in all like all of history and they need to make two billion dollars to even break even like i wonder what the break even point is for something like this because they say in the comment section and some of the designer stuff that they've been working in this game for like two or three years and with an nda and so what's the break even point for having an ip now of this caliber. I have no freaking clue. The other thing that you need to know when it comes to this is there's going to be exclusives. With the last couple games of Steam Forge, they have not necessarily gone the gameplay exclusive Kickstarter exclusive route. They have gone with Bardsung and they've gone with Monster Hunter, which have mostly been alternative sculpts or like non-gameplay additives. And this, they're doing full on, here you go, these two expansions right here are not going to be at retail. Now, is that going to be an asterisk? Not at retail widely, not at retail outside of our web shop or will be at our red shop, which we don't consider retail or just not available whatsoever. Because I don't really know. I don't really get that impression good either way. I don't know why anyone would get this. This doesn't even get you at the $89 level, this stretch goal right now, unless you're going to split your funds up. The 264 people or so that are backing at this level, I hope that's what you're doing is you're just splitting your funds up. You're going to upgrade to at least one of their pledge levels, even though about 16% of backers right now are not at a selected pledge level, which is slightly higher than average. I think they say in usual campaigns is about 10%. So take that for what you will. Not a huge deal either way. The average price 
uh, that people are paying right now is about $292. So that's sort of kind of where the statistics are being thrown right now. Again, you have to get through all of this. I, you're going to see how far I have to scroll down to get to some of the actual content of how you play. Now, again, they put the rule book up top. But here's finally when they get down to the daily unlocks here, the daily 10 goals that are going to be hidden, blah, 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 blah. And then they go through the core pledges. Then they give you some of this stuff right here, which is almost all the stuff that was on the designer diaries and the pages before. So I just wish this some of this stuff was at the top. It's at the very, very bottom along with the video. So uh, shipping is going to be what it's going to be. If you're buying any of those other pledge levels, you know, as I always say, which needs to be ground into the ground uh, repeatedly, uh, shipping shouldn't be your make it or break it. It shouldn't be at this point. Although I actually think that the shipping is probably low than I would expect given the five boxes and the size of the miniature. So take that for what you will. You know I'll be covering it. You know you should check out the video from earlier this week because it was a relatively good one by me, yours truly from that standpoint. But Elden Ring, the board game, I have plenty of thoughts on it further than this, but I'll leave it at there because otherwise I can ramble on this for like 10 more minutes. So there you go. That's first up this week. Next up, no small feat going head to head with Elden Ring this week though, Tiny Epic Crimes with the red reveal. I mean, they're using the red uh, decoder sort of thing, if you will. But this is gonna be a solo competitive and cooperative game where you're actually grid-based movement as you try to deduce one of five pieces of evidence to discover who the murderer is in the first place and you can work competitively as you're all going to be gathering separately or you can work together and you can sort of get uh, your own aspect of helping get all the evidence needed to be able to figure out who done it essentially now there's going to be two mini expansions that are going to make it more deluxe if you want that are not going to be in wide retail distribution if you're looking for reason or incentive to get it now as they've done with all of the previous tiny epics or most of them with from gamelin games uh, we'll get down here to what they are in a second. One is like a kingpin, and one is more of a uh, one versus all, or hidden identity. Hidden identity is what it is. Hidden identity, more role where you're either a crooked cop or a you know clean cop, and if you're the crooked cop, you make it all the way through, then you win, but if you get accused uh, and you know you get pointed out, I think you either lose or then it becomes a lot harder, sort of like Dead of Winter-ish, uh, but if you accuse wrong, then you can potentially be out of the game in the first place. This is a little bit different because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be introducing this decoder system, trying to figure out if this clue is successful or not using these evidence envelopes in order to do so sliding them in and out and how you're going to be doing this is you're going to be gradually going around and collecting evidence moving from location to location stopping mobsters stopping events that are going to be uh you know sort of helping you balance a, a little bit of a pandemic-esque situation that you can only have three out of a time at and if more come out then bad things happen and it you know resets everybody but this is going to be a little bit different in terms of how you're taking your turns because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking actually turn-based based on time, if that makes sense. So each of these actions are gonna cost you a certain amount of time. As you take more actions, you move further up the time chart. It sort of reminds me like Glenmore 2 Chronicles, if you will. The further back you are, the more actions you get to take to catch up to the next person. And when you reach anywhere between hours 43 and 48, that's considered the end game. And you get to the end, then everyone picks who they think did it, and then you simultaneously reveal. If more than one person is the person who's picked correctly, then it goes to the person who has the most badge tiers because as you accomplish things, as you discover things, you're gonna be moving up the ranks essentially. And if that's still equal, then it's who done it in the least amount of time because as I said, time actions and it's a range at the end 43 to 48 and so they run you through these events because they're going to give you youthful alibis and, and powers and force cards that are going to allow you to interrogate and do all those sorts of things then, then they talk about the kingpin here they're going to have a scheme and once they're known it's going to put more pressure on you as well to finish things sooner uh game rules are right here everything you need to know with a few videos as well is all well contained in this nutshell so that's everything i mean tiny epic games again just like elden ring i'll say the same thing about both of these i don't worry about the value i don't worry about perceived value i mean if you get the deluxified version of this game you'll not lose money on it elden ring again i'm not going to argue that it's a bad value either the pledge level content is going to be a ton of money and it's probably going to be more on the secondary market. It's just whether or not you want to spend it in the first place to take that risk because whew, we'll go there in a second. So, and speaking of this, by the way, um, the delivery date is May, 2024. Think about that for a second. We're, we're talking over a year and a half and that's if everything goes right from a shipping standpoint. And you know, Kickstarters as well as I do at this point that you usually assume that they're going to be six months late. So you're really talking probably the beginning of 2025 that's two years of $500 tied up in that. Just putting that out there as a full thought disclaimer, if you will. Next up, we're going to talk about pests. This is my sleeper hit of the week. If you're looking for something that's a little bit different, if you're looking for something that's a little bit flying under the radar, but still is 
almost 200% of its funding goal. Let's talk about Pest here for a second because this is basically the bubonic plague of the game, right? Uh, you are going to be dealing with plagues that are going to be affecting this main city over, I think, the six areas of the city that you're going to be moving around through, grabbing sick people, curing them, using the cured people to manage your buildings, the buildings that you build uh, sort of off of a player board that almost looks more reminiscent of Scythe in terms of unlocking things and unlocking abilities and you know how you can uh, do things differently, including uh, different actions, resources, technologies, just things that are going to make your life a little bit better in terms of doing what you're trying to do. Now, the game is played over three big rounds that are each divided into two phases. Each of the three rounds is going to have some sort of overarching curse or uh, regulation of how the pestilence, the plague, is going to be spreading. It's going to allow you to navigate or plan accordingly based on that. This is the Kickstarter exclusive uh, Capital City miniature pack that's free. So that's the little add-on deluxification of the reason to get it now. They run through the buildings that are going to be allowing you to rebuild people's homes and infrastructures and allow you better uh, you know, play, uh, engine build, if you will, in a little bit of a sense. Uh, you also have a little bit of deluxification here in the components of miniatures and a little wooden components in terms of the buildings. So uh, but like I said, you go through these uh, three rounds and then each round has sort of two different phases that you're going to be going back and forth. And we talk about the two phases right here, right? The pest and the aid phase. The pest is when that card is revealed. That plague card is going to show you where it's going to strike and so how you're going to have to prepare for possible outcomes. The aid card is revealed. If you did the best previously, with the most influential previously, you're going to get a greater aid and all the other players are going to get a lesser one in order to mitigate. The only question I have and the concern I have with that is could that lead to a little bit of a runaway leader situation? I don't know. I can't tell just based on what's on the page and reading the rule book during this phase as the next portion of things that's where you're just taking your actions moving your assistance around playing combos of actions including moving curing assigning producing constructing researching and the game ends after those three whole rounds of what you're doing because they say you're only playing three of those played cards obviously per game and there's going to be 10 of them in the game so you're not even going to see every one in you know three games worth so Take that for what you will. There's a lot of information here in terms of the page. You can check out the rule book as well, Tabletopia. There's a good amount that you could be able to get a relatively decent sense of things, but there is a little bit of area control worker placement-esque vibe. And so as someone who's not huge on that, I'm gonna have to give this one probably a harder look-see, but this is one that I also would have a heavy, heavy eye on from a retail standpoint, just knowing that I'm not huge necessarily on some of the miniatures in a game like this, or the plastic city that doesn't do a whole lot for me. I mean, the wooden buildings are nice, and I think those are probably a must, but the other stuff I could see myself passing on, and that's why it's $80 right now. I understand it, but it's not probably enough to necessarily incentivize me without having played it first. So this one is a good watch, good sleeper pick as something different that you should have your eye on regardless, though. Next up, we're gonna talk about Mycelium, a mushling game. Mycelium is a mushling game. This is a little bit of a different area control, not pick up and deliver, but kind of pick up and deliver, where you're gonna be creating these paths to these resource spots on the map, as you can see here. And the more touching paths that you have of the resource spot uh, determines how many of those resources you can bring back to you. But the tricky part is that you can actually battle other people and knock out some of their paths, which reduces their ability to bring in income, which drives their engine in the first place. And there's gonna be card-based play to go along with that to drive the attack and the defending. The tricky part and the sort of other twist on this game is that uh, they have sort of a system where you're putting out the card at the beginning of the round that determines what resources are getting placed where. But the next phase of things after that is gather your workers back up and bring in the resources. The very last thing that you are doing before the end of the round is placing your workers out speculatively to where you think things are gonna be or where you may need to get things from in anticipation. And that's the twist on things. And I don't know how well that can be done. I don't know if that's gonna work, but there's an, again, enough information, there's some gameplay on here. So if you wanna get a good sense of if that works or if you would like that, please give that a look-see. The advantage in really the upgrade here is a $50 retail pledge. The deluxe edition comes with two $5 mini expansions in terms of deluxe hero mushroom cards and Captain Mushroom mini expansion. Say that 10 times fast. But it gives you a nice overview here. This is literally like a player aid player board right there. There you go. Everything that I just said and running you through everything you need to know. Uh, they run through the different types of mushlings that you're going to be uh, dealing with, building, playing as, those sorts of things, as well as a couple of variants that they're going to be offering in terms of the gameplay 
uh, permanent powerful upgrades that are going to be available as items, Hero Tavern to provide alternate combat tokens, and a four-player variant to play two-on-two. Two. There's the videos, there's everything you need to know, a few stretch goals, which are true stretch goals, I'd say, and the pledge level, like I said, is 50 or $60. So that's Mycelium, definitely under radar indie hit, already funded, almost 200% again. Check it out. So next up, we're gonna talk about Cube Monster, my review coming out earlier in the week as well. Uh, $36,000 of a $20,000 goal. So again, another one that's almost 200% funded, and I thought this was 30,000 for some reason. Uh, whatever, excuse me. This is an engine building cube use climbing game, if that makes sense. Uh, what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be drawing cubes from a bag, you're gonna be assigning them to a cube monster board, where then you're gonna be putting one cube every single turn in the little monster portion of things. When you put one in the little monster portion of things, if you fill up a row or a column or a diagonal, four in a row, something bad can potentially happen. You have to offer a sacrifice in order to appease the monster. If you don't appease the monster, then bad things happen, cards get flipped over, and bad stuff can happen to your own board. And it can even destroy the buildings that you are literally in figuratively using as your engine. There are five different buildings that you're gonna be utilizing in terms of building your engine. They're gonna do everything from give you additional cubes when you draw a cube from the bag to allow you to Catan uh, trade in at a cheaper price or even allow you to sacrifice better to appease the monster. So those are the things you're gonna be doing and then you're gonna be climbing this board from one to two to three to four to five to six and if you get it to six you win or there's 16 rounds played which is a relatively short game believe me uh, you know, 16 sounds like that's a lot, but it's really not with how fast the turns actually play in this game. The main mechanism being, again, using those cubes in a dexteritous, but also efficient manner in order to build the buildings you need in combinations of said colored cubes. Sometimes you need three of a kind to build a factory, which gets you an extra cube of that certain color that you've used to build it in the first place. Or you're building one of the other ones that's a two by two that gets you um, an additional reward card, not only when you build it in the first place of the color that you build it in, or it also gives you one when you make an offering to the monster as well. So it's giving you a little bit of everything in there. Uh, the price point here is $99 and it gets you this little 3D monster board, which is kind of a really cool aesthetic. Uh, and so the base game alone, what was uh, $59 as well. I mean, these are nice, nice, nice cubes. These are large cubes. They're probably D6 size. So it's, you know, component quality is definitely what you're paying for there. Uh, 3D mountain here as well. Whoa, that's expensive, $200 for that. And if you really want one of these with professional, I think he, uh, the designer was was talking, I think I saw it on one of the updates, one of the emails, or no, it was the Facebook group. He said that his dad, I think, makes uh, some jewelry like this. And so like, it's from a, like a real jeweler. Yeah, so it's not just, you know, saying it from that standpoint. Um, yep, so there you go, ink final wash uh, with the miniatures. Again, I, I don't think the miniatures are completely necessary. I'd be happy with standees or just even a bigger wooden meeple component. I thought that was uh, something that I would just wouldn't have minded from that aspect of things. Uh, they run you through how to play here. Uh, they run you through the mechanics and everything else. There you go, video, 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 video. Um, yeah, so everything you need to see is on the page as well. So that is Cube Monster. Check it out if you're interested. Next up, we have Bazaars of Ubar. This is from Gray Fox Games. This is about 50% funded right now. What do you need to know in this tile laying, almost not Rondo based system, but very similar to like a Glenmore 2 Chronicle situation where the tiles that you're taking are going to have time-based values uh, according to the number of little time symbols on either the center of them or that are touching them from the tiles around them in a three by three grid. So you can imagine that the center tile is gonna have four other tiles touching it. So it's potentially gonna be a higher cost. But as you grab tiles from this three by three grid, they don't get replaced each round. And so then there's gonna be some gaps and then prices are eventually going to go down. And when you take the next tile is dependent on where you are in the placement order as you progress time-wise. And so that's going to be the big catch. And so when you grab that tile, then you put it in your tableau. And the tableau is also a very similar to Glenmore 2, actually in the same way. It's going to interact with the other tiles that are already there because you have to place it next to them, which may trigger um, things from happening, actions from happening, but then they're also gonna have something called a trade wind, which is also going to have an effect on the other area tiles around you. And so that's what you're going to be doing, managing the space, and then end of the round, you're gonna be selling the goods as you arrive at the next market. You do that three times, and that's the gist of the game. Gray Fox has done a little bit of deluxifications here. Uh, they've gone to the unlocks since they are not funded yet. Uh, so you're gonna see a little bit of exclusivity there and uh, two add-ons in terms of game mats and deluxe coins. So, critical previews here, a couple shipping, that's that's really about it. 
the cost of the game is $45 for the deluxe, and that's the only pledge level you need to know about. So that is Bazaars of Ubar. It's definitely got a little bit of a different vibe. I like the element of that keeping in the back and going next system as well as tile placement. So it's one of those that I don't necessarily need the deluxification. So what is it going to look like from a retail standpoint? Um, give it a look-see if you're interested. Next up, we're having Clash of Decks Season 3 from Groms out of France. And this is four new expansions that are being going along with this one-player or two-player dueling type almost lane battler you're going to have two bridges and you're going to be basically putting cards on one side of the bridge of the other and you're going to be playing them and a la magic the gathering you can't attack with the current ones that you play but if you played something else last round then you can move it across the bridge and attack the other side uh the other players cards if you will and you can either draft you can priest construct or there's a, another variant i believe that you can do as well they're going to be, again, 144 new cards, 11 new grimoires of challenges that you can go through. And this is season three to go on top of the other two seasons that are out there in terms of content. It appears that they're going to have a new game mode here with two versus two uh, co-op as well. And so we're going to see just what all they're offering. There are something like eight new special abilities on top of, I, I was looking at the rule book for like the original version, like 19 abilities in that. And so that's probably the biggest challenge is learning some of the abilities and the curve and the interactions and the meta gaming that goes along with that. Because although it's simple, there's going to be a lot of that as well because your card deck is only eight cards. And on your turn, the amount of mana that you can play, the cost of these cards is written on the cards, but the energy that you have essentially is how many cards are in your hand. And so the game goes until someone either does enough damage to destroy the other person's castle or you run out of cards. So that's Clash of Decks. Now, it's a little bit more expensive than the previous campaigns just by the amount of stuff that they're offering. And the first time around, they really got people hooked in that sense. I think it was like two bucks overall uh, to get people in because it's been sort of a model release every couple months, every year or so. And so the four standalone expansions here are going to cost you a little over $40. And if you want to get everything, it's only going to cost you $83. So just take it for what you will. It's a little bit of Hearthstone-y card type play in addition to that although it's again like i said it's more of a lane battler so that's clash of decks season three check it out if you're interested for something light two-player ish dueling but now with a couple other new modes we're going back to henchmania which i talked about a week or two ago this is the new expansion with a new edition of henchmania as a i think it's two to five player game it is almost 150% funded at the time of filming this. And that was interesting because it was almost funded. Now the funding goal was actually a little bit higher last time. It was $35,000 and they got 34 of the 35, but I don't know if they just didn't hit stretch goals fast enough. But I mean, either way, we're only $3,000 over in slightly less time than last time. So I don't really know. I think the price point is slightly lower as well this time around. If you want the new stuff with the new expansion, the new modules, you get it for $17. If you want a new edition, it's going to cost you about $37. And the all-in pledge with everything is going to cost you a little over $50. The concept of the game is relatively simple. You're going to be playing your characters into one of the five areas. You draw one of those cards, you collect those cards, and you play them in terms of the actions that you can take. You're going to be battling each other, apparently even dueling each other in terms of attacking and defense, but that's going to be a die-based system where you're going to be playing equipment as your attack cards and you roll, if you're the attacker, three dice in order to try and hit the number that is achieved on those cards in the first place. If you do, then the defender actually has to roll and try and defend. If they can't, well, obviously they take damage, they lose points. It runs you through all of the different factions here in terms of the abilities and the interactions and the uh, differences and all they're going to be putting out there. They run you through the two modules here of the King's Whims and the Throne Room Pledge. Again, there's the All In, there's the Retailer Pledge. They're hitting a few stretch goals as well. Add-ons here as well, including the Sanctuary expansion and as well as an add-on here for the update if you have a previous version and you want to get the new version. A few stretch goals in terms of social media goals and they run you again through, like I said here, how you play. You grab one of your meeples, you place them in an area, you pick a corresponding card of that color, then you get to play a card per turn. There's two different types of cards in those five different areas that you can play. And then you can attack and go back and forth, adding your numbers, going back and forth in terms of who's winning and losing. A little bit of everything there from a video standpoint. I mean, it's doing better than it did. Again, this is one of those relaunches where I go, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's going to do fine. Now, did they need to relaunch? Would they have done it just as good? I, I don't know. I mean, that's up for you guys to debate, but that's Henchmania, the new edition as well. Next up, we're going to have Axon Protocol. Now, I was going to give this one a harder look-see, but the rulebook is in a RAR file, so... 
I didn't really want to mess with that. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a synopsis, but if you're more interested, definitely give this one a check out. The problem with it is there's not a whole lot else on the page to actually explain what you're doing. I mean, you talk about the two to six player mechanic called shared worker control, where you're moving around workers sharedly, obviously, and then you're going to be essentially playing one of 30 unique cards or characters with unique abilities that you're going to be able to manipulate either attacking other people's characters or utilizing their own abilities in order to do resources, attacking other characters. And if somebody causes the city to reach its breaking point the game ends and you have the most resources you win so that's everything that's there there's a few videos down here but i just need a little bit something more of what the game flow is actually like on the page that would be really nice i like the fact that they've got acrylic standee option as well but this is one that i want to see more in person or a try before i buy so if you're interested in this one i highly recommend that you check out the videos or you go the extra strap and open the rare file uh, for the rule book so you can get a better sense of what the game flow is actually like because I think this one has some potential and it's almost fun at the time of me filming this. So definitely give it a look-see when it actually funds because I guarantee by the time you're watching this video, it will be funded. Next up, we're talking about World Stitches 40% funded one to four player modular tying lane game where you're gathering stamina to use it to get energy or vice versa, I'm trying to remember which way, but essentially what you're doing is you're drafting tiles out of the center uh, that's costing you a certain amount of stamina. Stamina allows you to get energy. You're connecting these tiles in order to make contiguous areas. If you can move contiguous areas, you can have your little meeples go across. That gathers the energy that you need. The game ends when somebody has built three spires, which take eight energy, which is a significant bigger building than what you're normally doing on a regular turn, or somebody has a total of 40 energy tokens. Now it comes with a total of four modules that you can see here that it says variable player power, secret goals, etc. Uh, they don't talk about a whole lot of the uh, modularity in terms of what it's bringing to the table in terms of what they actually are here uh, on the rule book. So I'm guessing they're going to be individually uh, sectioned out so you can get a sense of that later at a time. But again, there's a lot of video here as well, a few stretch goals. And again, it's going to be one of those where is it going to hit the funding? Are they going to have to relaunch? What else is it needing? Because it's off to a relatively slow start, but we'll see where it ends up by the time it finishes. Now we're going to hop over to GameFound. We're going to go over to custom bags and playmats. Um, I talked about this one previously last week, and this is just, you know, bag playmat adjacent from that aspect. So the twist on this is that their playmats are a little bit more sized. If you can see this over here, they've got a little bit more variability than some of the other companies like Game Crafter, Tabletop, or Board Game Tables. So it also gives you the option for LEDs. And I don't know, do people want LEDs on their playmats? I, I don't really know. I feel like it could go either way. Like an LED playmat would be great for like my table here for like when I do overhead shots of reviews and talking about games in that sense. But I don't know how it would work on regular tables. Like my kitchen table, I don't know either. But if you have one of those inlay or sort of set down like actual gaming gaming tables, then I bet an LED would actually look kind of cool. Because I know a lot of people put LEDs around their actual table themselves. And so if you had it included in the playmat, I could see where that's kind of an interesting uh, thing to have there. It kind of spruces it up, right? Gives a little bit spice of life. And then they have the board games. Uh, and then they have the board game bags here, which are a little bit bigger. I have mine. Actually, I think it's in the closet out in the hall. Uh, but it's $79. This is slightly bigger, I'd say, or you know what? It's probably about the same size as my other one. It's got a little bit more packaging on the outside as well for the external pockets and the special cords for playmats, which is something new that I don't see a lot of. So again, I, I am a little bit surprised. This is actually having a little bit of trouble funding uh, because it's only about halfway done, but this seems to be a relatively popular product in general. I do wonder, and I get, they have more images and pictures here than I ever imagined, more than most of the other campaigns I've seen previously with this, if it's a little bit of the game found effect, because I see this not necessarily getting as much just traffic that, say, Kickstarter would get, and I have to wonder if there's a little bit of that aspect. But um, yeah, this is probably the one I would need right here, the 36 by 36. I've been having a hard time finding another company that actually does 36 or 30-ish by 30-ish, because that's kind of what I need. And a lot of them do just preset sizes, which I completely understand. And a couple that are uh, customizable, but again, it's you know not much cheaper customizable even without the LED. So this is actually a relatively good price because I was actually looking at these about two weeks ago uh, for just this purpose of doing it on this table for my playthroughs and gameplay content uh, with my reviews. So that's why I've had one on my radar and that's kind of how I came across it. But that is your custom bags and playmats. If you are interested, definitely give it a look-see. Um, it's from Crafting Kingdom. Check it out. Now we're going to go over to Mystia and Ikeon uh, from Tabula Games. I mispronounced that probably. Uh, $22,000. So you're getting solo modes for both of these games. More of the worker placement and the area control additions of their previous games in their 
preset universe. And so it's by Turksy. You're going to get a good combination of gameplay mechanics and depth there. I don't have any doubt from that aspect of things. I don't really hear a lot about these games, surprisingly, one way or the other. Um, they've done really well on crowdfunding without doubt with their previous editions. Uh, even the one that was previously crowdfunded that I had a chance to test this year, um, Ryozen did relatively well, but I just don't see a lot of mention of it at the same time. So I don't really know what the market is for something like this. Again, I'm not necessarily a, a solo player. I play games solo we to experience them, to teach them, to learn them. Uh, to be able to simulate two-player games, but I don't do a whole lot of solo, solo gaming. So this is not going to be for me, but I know a lot of people are out there. I mean, that's why this has $20,000 already, right? Let's see what the rewards are. When we get down to the pledge levels here, um, the early bird for both solo expansions is 22 euros, which isn't actually that much at all considering, uh, but that's by far the most away pledged of all of them. And there's, you know, a relatively small smattering across all the other ones, including the essential editions of both games. There's nothing overwhelming like that. So it just runs you through what else it is. I can't speak to these games. I'm not familiar with either of them extensively. They do have the rule books if you're interested in either of these, as well as a bunch of the videos to go along supporting them. So if you have any interest, especially from the solo mode from our worker placement game or a slightly heavier area control style game, um, definitely give this a look-see from Tabula Games. There we go. That's it. That's the roundup for this week. Everything that you need to know and everything that could be, should be on your radar. And don't sleep on tomorrow and next week because there are a few very notable games. Nothing that is going to break the, you know, seven figure, eight figure mark. But there's a few things that definitely will catch your interest before the end of November and the first week of December. Those are sort of the two weeks in the rest of the year that you really need to watch out for. The end of December is relatively going into the new year like a lamb. It's There's really hardly anything announced. There's hardly anything that's probably going to come up, but there's always a few surprises along the way. So, you know, it's not like I'm going to stop doing this just because whatever, right? Because I like talking about these games every single week because it's fun. I enjoy it. That's all I got. Stay classy. Have a great day. Hopefully you didn't work today like I did. And yesterday I worked Thanksgiving too. Anyway, that's all I got. <laughs> See you around. Peace out. I have been having a hard time finding another company that doesn't do... Uh, I've been having a, a fart...